Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Inclusive Narratives of Management History series in the Management History Division of the Academy of Management. I'm Dr. Leon Prieto, and I serve as the Division Chair of the Management History Division of AOM. So today's 30-minute presentation is entitled The Occupational Identity of Black Civil Rights Lawyers, The History of Resistance, Resilience and Representation. The esteemed speaker is Dr. Holly Slay Ferrari, and she's an Associate Professor of Management and the Faculty Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Teaching and Research at the Villanova University School of Business. She earned a PhD in Organizational Behavior from the University of Maryland College Park, and her research examines how people grapple with dimensions of self, example, age, race, and gender, in making career decisions. And she aims to add to our knowledge of how growth, learning, and superior performance occur in the face of forces that cause people to question their beliefs about who they are or should be. Dr. Ferraro has published articles in Human Relations, Human Resource Management, Group and Organization Management, and the Journal of Leadership and Organizational Studies. So we ask that you go on mute and save questions to the very end, because we have 15 minutes of questions and answers allotted for this, uh, for this talk. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the mic to Dr. Holly slade Corral, and we're so honored to have you as part of this discussion. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank Dr. Prieto and the Management History Division of the Academy of Management for inviting me to share my work with you. Uh, this is some relatively new work that I've begun examining the history of civil rights law as a profession and what we can learn, especially about professional identity when we study the lives of the Black men and women who really founded this field. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. All right, so here's how we're gonna spend our time together. First, I'd like to lay a foundation by talking about professional identity research. And then I'll share why I am especially interested in civil rights law and black civil rights lawyers. Next, I'll share a narrative history of Black civil rights lawyers in what I like to call three acts, Reconstruction, the Golden Age of Black business, and the Civil Rights Era. And finally, I'd like to share what I think are some important implications, including a nascent framework about professional identification, and close with what I really would prefer to call Q&D, so questions and discussions. So let's start by thinking about occupational or professional identity. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. Historically, professional identity has focused on how people derive self meanings from the work tasks that they do. An example of research that centers work tasks might be this paper that was written by Ahuja and colleagues in 2017 that talked about identity paradox. And specifically, this was in architects. So architects are generally consider themselves to be creative, aesthetic, design professionals, but they also have this side of their work that's about being managerial and finance focused. And when they have to change work tasks to be that more managerial finance focused person, then it changes how they think about both the profession of architect and also themselves. Now, Ashcraft extended our understanding of professional and occupational identity by helping us see how societal status hierarchies associated with social identities influenced professional identity. Specifically, she suggests that we discriminate against work on the basis of who does it, not just the actual work done. 
And she does this beautiful job of talking about the establishment of the profession of airline pilot. This profession has been constructed even to this day as masculine, initially because men primarily flew planes, but not exclusively even back then. We know that Bessie Smith and Amelia Earhart were flying. But once it was constructed as masculine, then that gave meaning to the tasks as being highly skilled, as being highly physical, and therefore it should be highly paid, <laughs> more highly paid than when it was associated with just women. In this presentation, I want to suggest that occupational identity is also derived from who you are doing the work for. The clients or the consumer of professional of work, along with the practitioner of the work, shifts how we evaluate the profession. So how much status do we do it? How do we give to it? How people should behave in it? Who pursues the profession and material conditions? Like how do you retrain folks and how much earnings are associated with the profession? To demonstrate this relationship, I move now to discussing why civil rights lawyers serve as good populations for understanding how practitioners, work tasks, and consumers work together to create professional identity. So why study Black civil rights lawyer? The concept of civil rights lawyer is relatively young in American history, of civil rights itself is relatively young in our history. Uh, White, who is a legal historian in 2014, talks about how civil rights was not part of the early legal landscape of the United States, despite the Constitution addressing the privileges of citizenship, which we can all quote in terms of inalienable rights. The terms, the term civil rights itself is noticeably absent. My research suggests that it wasn't until the era of Reconstruction following the Civil War that the notion of civil rights began to take form. And this period witnessed pivotal legislative milestones like the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and several constitutional amendments, including the 13th Amendment, which empowered Congress to enforce profound changes in the treatment of African Americans, both in the former Confederate States, but obviously it would extend nationwide. So it makes sense to me that we understand civil rights didn't formally exist in the United States as a legal framework before the Civil War, because the majority of Black individuals of African descent were either enslaved or formally enslaved while indigenous people frequently found their rights violated or denied. Thus the emergence of civil rights as a defined legal framework seems unsurprising that it didn't happen before this time given this historical context. Now, as you may expect, resistance, resistance to these nascent civil rights laws was robust. There were folks that were intent on preserving the autonomy of states to continue to oppress their newly freed citizens. Enter the civil rights lawyer. These are the folks who championed the enforcement of these emergent laws and sought to establish precedents that shape their interpretation and also their implementation. Their efforts were instrumental in defining and defending the rights of all citizens under the law. It took many decades of legal maneuvering for civil rights legislation to take form with the legislative measures and landmark court cases gradually establishing precedents that established the civil rights protections that we now enjoy and are actually still being challenged to this day. I focus on Black civil rights lawyers because as practitioners, they are also beneficiaries of civil rights laws in ways that are different than their white counterparts. So let's start our first act, Reconstruction. 
This era is characterized by pervasive racial violence and a fervent effort among white communities in the former Confederate states to reclaim the world before the Civil War. It's in the wake of emancipation that Black codes are established that aim to relegate Black individuals back to a state of cheap or even free labor. And this is often by ensnaring them in racially weaponized criminal justice systems. Against this bleak backdrop, the 1875 Civil Rights Bill supported by people like Congressman John Lynch, who is a Black congressman from Mississippi, promised equal access to public accommodations and facilities for all, regardless of race or previous state of servitude. However, the United States Supreme Court deals a crushing blow to this legislation, declaring it unconstitutional on the grounds that it overreached federal authority by attempting to regulate individual behavior rather than state behavior. This ruling, as many of you know, served as a precursor to the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson case that effectively solidified Jim Crow segregation as the law of the land. Faced with this setback, Black civil rights lawyers embarked on a multifaceted approach to combat injustice. These advocates championed rights based on natural and inalienable principles, which is in the Constitution, inherent to all individuals regardless of race, but they also emphasized the importance of Black progress and self-reliance, highlighting the virtues of citizenship, due diligence, thrift, and the cultivation of Black-owned institutions. In what some people considered a really strategic shift, leaders in the Black community, such as Booker T. Washington, and even W.E.B. Du Bois at this time, pivoted toward leveraging economic empowerment as a means to catalyze social change. They recognized the importance of creating an economy independent of the need for white approval or acceptance of white equality. They sought to foster prosperous Black businesses and to nurture a Black middle class. Their, this is all their way of reshaping the power dynamics and fostering genuine societal transformation by navigating the complexity of these times by suggesting that there would be a kind of volunteerism when we have Black diligence, thrift, the cultivation of Black-owned institutions, whites would voluntarily give citizenship rights to Black folks. This leads us to the golden age, our second act, the golden age of Black business from 1900 to 1930. And it's during this period that leaders within the Black community appealed to white communities to support the cause of civil rights by highlighting Black progress in that Reconstruction era, in forging a middle class, establishing businesses, and entering professional fields. We have numerous members of the Black community contending that granting equal citizenship rights to Black individuals, coupled with non-interference by white folks, would pave the way for both individual and collective racial advancement. Now, Eric Forner, who is a historian, sheds light on a prevailing racist anxiety that is gripping society at this time. There's this apprehension that extending civil rights to Black citizens would unleash a wave of transformative social dynamics. And really what that meant was people were afraid of interracial marriage and interracial sexual relationships. And this fear loomed large with the term amalgamation being a dog whistle for white supremacists. Amidst these concerns, we find that leaders of the Black community and members of the Republican Party sought to really clarify their intentions. They adamantly emphasized that the push for civil rights wasn't about fostering racial mingling, but rather about securing economic and political rights. And it's to this end that Charles Hamilton Houston, who's pictured here, 
and who is also often credited with developing the legal strategies that the NAACP legal defense team used to litigate civil rights cases, he originally advocated for a form of social engineering, emphasizing the importance of building relationships between Black-owned businesses and the Black community. Rather than focusing solely on litigation, Houston championed an incrementalist approach originally. He wanted to improve community life through initiatives such as better schools, infrastructure, and addressing specific racial injustices through litigation. His leadership at Howard University's law school, where he was dean, underscored a commitment to professional competence with an emphasis on small business and practical work coursework that was relevant to everyday life. The civil rights courses appeared later in the history of Howard University's law school, not at the beginning. This vision of the university coincided with this burgeoning era of business growth. And so he desired that Harvard Law School would prioritize business and commercial practice. There, we see this integration of legal education with economic empowerment, reflecting this approach to advancing civil rights aligned really with the complexities of the context. And as the 1930s progressed, this intersection of voluntarist and civil rights ideologies gained momentum, capturing the attention and support of an expanding array of individuals. For example, Raymond Pace Alexander, who is the president of the National Bar Association, which is the Black Bar Association, championed the role of the Black middle class as a catalyst for anti-discrimination efforts, presenting them as representative Negroes, capable of bridging the racial divide between whites and Blacks by showcasing Black progress. This, stri this strategy extended to legal battles where Black attorneys often presented representative Negroes as plaintiffs, such as Ivy League educated individuals, Black individuals, to challenge discriminatory practices. So there was a theater, for example, that would not permit Black folks to enter, and the plaintiffs in the litigation against that theater were Ivy League educated individuals to show, look at the kinds of people that you say you want to keep out of your institution just based on race. However, when the plaintiffs were poor, uneducated laborers or sharecroppers, farmers, lawyers like Houston relied on their own representative Negro status to advocate for justice. A good example of this is the case of George Crawford. Now, George Crawford was accused of murdering two white women, and he was convicted on that charge. But instead of receiving the expected death sentence, he received life in prison because of Houston's courtroom acumen. This case really is an example of the respect that was accorded to Black lawyers within the legal system when they appealed to the idea of the representative Negro, even in the face of very racially charged accusations. In some, the overarching strategy of the Black Bar was not merely to change laws, but to transform public opinion through social engineering. This approach aimed to lay the groundwork for legal change by shifting societal attitudes toward racial equality. Now, we can't talk about this period between 1900 and 1930 without talking about the Great Depression. Because of the Great Depression, there were calls for the Black Bar to focus on defending the right to work, perhaps more than some of these other civil rights issues, further highlighting the interconnectedness of economic and civil rights struggles during this period. Unfortunately, we also have to mention that this period continued continue to be marked by racial massacres, such as the Red Summer, where Black soldiers returning from World War I were sometimes lynched in their uniforms. There were a number of racial riots throughout the United States in the summer of 1919. Many of us are also aware of the Tulsa massacre that occurred, 
that occurred in what is known as one of the Black Wall Streets in 1921. Neither of these are anomalies. In 1906, there was the Atlanta massacre where four white women claimed to be assaulted by black men. Later, these charges were discovered to be false. However, black communities and businesses were destroyed. In 1919, there was the Elaine massacre in Arkansas. The Encyclopedia of Arkansas says that the Elaine massacre by far was the deadliest racial confrontation in Arkansas history and possibly the bloodiest racial conflict in the history of the United States. And what's happening here? Economic injustices spurred the creation of a union to protect sharecroppers. And when the union workers met together uh, to talk about the war, when the black workers met together to talk about the formation of the union, this led to a white riot that resulted in a fatality. And inflamed by these unfounded fears that there was going to be a Black insurrection, hundreds of whites launched violent attacks on Black residents, prompting resistance from the Black residents. And in the aftermath, there were 200 Black individuals, including children, who had been killed and their survivors were subjected to arrest and torture. Coming out of this was the Elaine 12, which were a dozen men who faced Death, sentence, death sentences after coerced confessions. These folks were exonerated by the Supreme Court in one of the first NAACP's major legal successes. Now, I share these massacres really to underscore that the context and the experience of Black people in the country very naturally led to the next era of civil rights lawyering. And that's our last act, the civil rights era. This is from 1938 to 1968. And in Leroy Clark's 1970 law review article, he highlights that there's a pivotal aspect of activism. There's a change here, the priority of ending inhumane treatment over the strict adherence to law. So lawyers are often focused on challenging the unconstitutional administration of state laws, but activists are spurred by the urgent need to address instances of cruelty, murder, and injustice. However, even after legal victories, activists and Black communities continued to face mistreatment, and this created a tension between legal strategies and direct action. In response to this tension, civil rights lawyers adapted, again, a multifaceted approach, utilizing legal avenues to combat discrimination in both public and private domains. So let's talk for a second again about private domains. This is possible, be possible because during the New Deal era, many private sector companies benefited from government financial support. And this allowed civil rights lawyers to challenge them in court. Remember that the Civil Rights Act of 1865 was found to be unconstitutional and it limited civil rights enforcement to government entities. But with private companies benefiting from government contracts, they became subject to civil rights enforcement action. And with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited employment discrimination, the role of civil rights lawyers evolved even further. However, enforcement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was challenging. Although the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was tasked with enforcing the act, it lacked real power. They had the power to investigate claims and to engage in conciliation between parties but effective enforcement really required private litigation. And employment litigation presented some unique hurdles different from school uh, litig litigation because there were difficulties in gathering evidence and there was opposition from well-funded corporate lawyers and unsympathetic judges. So the legal maneuver of the time was to exhaust the resources of folks like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and then to deter plaintiffs from pursuing action. 
Civil rights lawyers also during this time faced decisions about who they were going to represent within the movement. Some groups like those advocating for black power were deemed to be too militant and lawyers tended to align with the causes and the groups that appealed to broader audiences, particularly white liberals who provided financial support for litigation. So let's try to do some synthesis of those three acts. As I've started to analyze the stories of Black lawyers and the legal histories that scholars have developed, I see the relationship between the social context, such as the Reconstruction period, the role of the courts, and the professional identity of Black civil rights lawyers. And on this slide, I've abbreviated Black civil rights lawyers as BCRL. For example, we have the Reconstruction period from 1865 to 1900, at this time, the courts are reinforcers of racial hierarchy or white supremacy. We have the Supreme Court rule that the 1875 Civil Rights Act is unconstitutional and then institute Jim Crow through Plessy versus Ferguson. And it is in that era that we see black civil rights lawyers argue for their inalienable rights as human beings, but also argue for the politics of racial uplift and respectability for black folks. Evelyn Higginbotham, who, who coined the term respectability notes, respectability politics notes that black folks thought that when they show themselves worthy of full citizenship by conformity with white standards, then it would be given to them voluntarily. It seems to me that the ethos of the reconstruction period gave rise to the golden age of black business from 1900 to 1938. Black folks see that reconstruction is collapsing that liberatory politics interest is waning. And many Black folks argued that if white folks would just leave Black folks alone, then they would see Black people emerge from the shadow of slavery. The courts should be a place where Blacks and whites can reimagine race. That is, the courts should stop folks who want to restrict Black folks' engagement in commerce, it should ensure that Black folks are protected from extrajudicial actions uh, like lynchings. It should give skillful Black lawyers the same degree of respect as skillful white lawyers. And to help white people see their obligations, Black civil rights lawyers pointed to racial representatives, including themselves. In effect, they are saying, let me show you examples of Blacks who meet your standards and you will see our worthiness. And if the folks I show you are convincing, look at me, the Black civil rights lawyer as a racial representative. Finally, during the civil rights era from 1938 to 1968, Black folks have tried economic empowerment. They've tried racial uplift and respectability, respectability politics, but deep segregation white supremacy, murder, and denial of civil rights have not ceased. Activists look to civil disobedience, turning the idea of respectability on its head. That is, it is respectable to break the law when the law is unjust. And at this time, the courts become places to re restructure society, and the Black civil rights lawyer is a partner with activists. They look for cases that can help to change society. The evolution of the black lawyer is different from ideals, from the ideals of professionalism that are cited by some legal scholars. In 2003, legal scholar Norman Spaulding wrote an article titled Reinterpreting Professional Identity. And in it, he suggests two kinds of professional identification, which I've tried to represent on this slide. Spalding describes the thin identification as the ideal. In this instance, the lawyer remains detached so that they can dispassionately practice law and protect their client's interests within the confines of the law. Thin identification suggests a neutral partnership where regardless of who your client is, the practitioner must pursue any legal ends by any legal means. He writes that in his opinion, the legal ethics require that, and this is a quote, 
A lawyer generally should not identify or be identified with the client she represents, and she should not select clients based on the intensity of her identification with their personal attributes or legal positions. In a footnote, he does suggest that, our, that there are times when racially conscious lawyering is important and in the service of justice. But in general, thin identification is the ideal. Spalding also describes thick identification, which he calls a self-centered perversion of the service ideal. Spalding is often talking about financial self-interest, but his concerns are not limited to that. Specifically, he defines cause lawyering as practitioners engaged in using the law to achieve social change. And he condemns it. I don't think that's too strong a term because it is about the self-realization of the lawyer. It is lawyer-centered, perhaps more than client-centered, and as such may lead the lawyer to engage in unethical activities to win cases or advance their cause. However, Harvard legal scholar David Wilkins proposes the idea of race conscious professionalism, where black lawyers are aware of and operating in three domains. First, they have a sense, they understand the legitimate demands that are part and parcel of being a lawyer. Second, they have a sense of obligation to the black community if for no other reason, because they are members of that community and they have some degree of linked fate. And third, they operate within the realm of their right to personal fulfillment, taking cases that are meaningful to them. I think this idea of race conscious lawyering has lots to teach us about race conscious leadership in many spheres. And this is an area I wish to pursue more as I continue this line of research. So what are the implications? We could know so much more about the landscape, process, and outcomes of professional identity if we study the history and lived experience of marginalized people. This exploration, my exploration currently of Black civil rights lawyers, helps us to see how a new field, civil rights law, was established and how lawyers came to understand their place within the field and within the broader context. Second, while we know that practitioner identity influences professional practices, I think we can better understand through the study of Black civil rights lawyers, how the treatment and identity of constituents also influences professional identity. And this is an area I really find fascinating um, and hope to learn more about. And with that in mind, I turn to our questions and discussions. Thank you for listening to me for the last 30 minutes, and I'm interested in your questions. Well, first and foremost, we have, we have to thank you for this really wonderful presentation. So I want to give you a round of applause for this, you know, so this is an exciting line of research to explore other professions, you know, so we certainly thank you for joining.